Well done. Thank you. Open your Bible, please, to actually chapter 28 of Second Chronicles. Chapter 28, we'll be beginning there. In the news, we've uh, all seen the stories and seen the pictures of the uh, hurricane they call Florence, I believe, and uh, the devastation uh, and how these floodwaters came in. And uh, it's not over yet, folks. There's still more flooding to happen, I'm sure, according to the reports I've read, a lot of damage. <clears throat> They're going to be repairing that part of the country for a long time. Over in Indonesia, they experienced a tsunami. And uh, that has uh, killed over 800 people. It has just wiped out um, large sections of landscape, houses, just gone. They're going to be a long time rebuilding and putting things back to normal. Have you ever been in a situation where you've had to do a cleanup to put things back the way they ought to be? Maybe if you're a grandparent and after your, your grandchildren leave for the day, you have to put your house back in order. That's just a small one, I suppose. That's a joy to have the grandchildren over. But the cleanup process with some, um, some events can be enormous. If you have to clean up your life, if you find your life in a bit of a wreck or a shamble, and to clean that up, it doesn't happen overnight. And it can take a long time to do. Here in the scriptures, we have a story of a cleanup that was in progress. And Hezekiah, the king, was the man who was trying to clean up his whole country. And we're going to look at something that happened today. And we're going to look at an aspect of God. And it could only be of God. And I pray that it will be an encouragement to your heart. Let's bow our heads and ask the Lord to help us to understand the scriptures today. Our Heavenly Father, as we humble ourselves before your mighty throne of grace and love and mercy, we acknowledge your sovereignty. We acknowledge that we need you, Lord, every day, every moment. It's good for us to be together in your house. Thank you, Lord, that we're gathered. And we pray that you'd please now have the Holy Spirit be the teacher to our hearts. And Lord, if there's things that aren't in proper place, please show us and show us how to put them back the way they ought to be. We pray that you would uh, teach us something about yourself, Lord. And we want to glorify you and honor you so much. And so have thine own way, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Every month I've been trying to bring something uh, about uh, God. And uh, a couple of those months, I think I've tried to bring a couple of messages. You know, uh, all through eternity, we'll be learning more and more things about God. And so I don't think we've exactly exhausted, you know, the, the list. There's still more things about God we can learn. But there's something I want you to see here today. Now, our story actually begins back in chapter 28. If you look, please, at verse 16, we have uh, uh, a rascal by the name of Ahaz. He was the king. Uh, and Ahaz sent unto the kings of Assyria. Those were the bad, bad guys. Now, Ahaz may have been a rascal, but the kings of Assyria were the real rascal, really super bad guys, like evil to the power of 10 or something like that. And he was sending unto them for their help. When the day comes when you and I have to look to the evil world for help, we got bigger problems than we realize. The Lord is our help. The Lord is our shield and our buckler. We don't need to go anywhere else. God wants to be our sufficiency. King Ahaz didn't have his eyes on the Lord. He knew about God, but I don't believe he actually knew him personally. You know, there's quite a difference about knowing about God and actually knowing him personally. Many people in the world are very adamant and they say, well, you can know about God, but there's no way you can know him personally. And I take exception with that because God is a personal God. I first met him 43 and a half years ago and he's never left me a day in my life since. 
and all over all these decades, I think I've drawn, drawn a little closer to him. I know he's alive. I know he listens to me because I was talking to him this morning. I got alone with him in the prayer closet. And it's wonderful to have a, a, an intimacy with Almighty God. Otherwise, all you're left with religiosity. A bunch of beads or a few words on a paper to, you know, to try and pray. Like, what's that? That's nothing. We want to have an, an intimacy with Almighty God. When I married my wife 37 plus years ago, uh, I wanted to know her, everything about her. I wanted to be with her and live with her and grow old together. And that's normal, isn't it? You know, married couples like to do that. But imagine this. If at the uh, altar when I proposed and she you know, accepted and, you know, that do you take, I do sort of thing. Oh, do I, do I? And so then I now pronounce you husband and wife. They gave me a piece of paper and said, okay, we'll see you later. What's this? Well, that's your marriage certificate. Well, where's my wife? You don't get her. What are you, nuts? You get a piece of paper. You want to give you a picture here. That's about it. I don't want a piece of paper with a I want her. Uh, if you were treated that way, you know, those of you who are married and you got married there and you're given a piece of paper and a picture maybe, you'd say, what's this? I want, I want the person I just married. Oh, you can't have them. Well, that's insane. For people to say we cannot know God intimately, personally, that's insane. Who wants a religiosity? Who wants to just kind of go to some kind of religious meeting and, and say a bunch of prayers that they don't understand or push beads through their finger or light candles or, or go through baptism or any of and all of those things? Who cares if God's not there? Who cares? I believe that Jesus is present here today in his house where two or three are gathered together. There am I in the midst. F folks, we got that one covered. Jesus is here today. That's good. And if he's not here, tell me where he is because I want to be where he is. If he's not here, let's close the doors. Let's turn off the lights and let's go find him. But this is the house of the Lord. That's what the word church means. That's why I'm so glad, I'm so happy that we can have an intimate, one-on-one, -on -one, close, personal contact, association, father-child relationship with Almighty God. And we can have that every day of our lives. Hezekiah had a big job coming because Ahaz was the king before him. It was his daddy. Now, I want to point out something here. And this is where some of the critics of the Bible jump up and down. If you look, please, um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Get to verse 19. Uh, for the Lord brought Judah low because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria. He's the bad, bad guy came unto him and distressed him, but strengthened him not. And so poor old uh, Judah and Israel, all the land, the holy land there with all their people and everything, they got trounced real good. All goes back to this idiot named Ahaz. And uh, if you look at verse 23, at the end of verse 23, it says, but they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. And uh, the context there is idolatry. And that's pretty much what Ahaz uh, had in his home was idols. You know, idolatry will ruin a man. It will ruin a man. Idolatry will ruin a man. If you and I do not worship the one true and only God, the creator God, beside whom there is no other, there are not multiplicities of God, there's one God. And if we do not know him and worship him, then what do we got, an idol? What do we got in our home? What do we got in our heart, in our head? It's got to be some kind of idol if we're not worshiping the one true God. Now, verse 27, some of the enemies of the Bible say, okay, Ahaz slept with his fathers. They buried him. Okay, well, he, was, he died. He was 36 years of age when he died. 36 years of age when he died. Now, look at the end of the verse. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his stead. Okay, so the 36-year-old man had a son. How old was his little boy? Chapter 29, verse 1. Hezekiah began to reign when he was 5 and 20 years old. How old does that make him? I think someone said it. 25. 
25. Wait a minute, just a minute, hold on, hang on, I can do the math. His dad was 36 and he's 25? Oh, come on, you see, that's got to be an error in the Bible. And the enemies of the Bible jump over things like this. Uh, that means that he would have had to been 11 or 12 years of age when his son was born. Come on, that's impossible. Well, I have an answer for those people. Come on, that is possible. Listen, on January 20th, 1998, a 12-year-old boy named Sean Stewart of Sharnbrook, England, fathered a six-pound baby boy. And he was 12 years old. So don't tell me it can't be done. Ahaz was a wicked guy. And so I have no problem believing the Bible. Thank you. I, he was messed up, wasn't he? Sounds like he was messed up since he was a kid. Some people are that way. So then we get to chapter 29. And look, please, at verse 5. Uh, here, Hezekiah had this big cleanup job on his hands. And he, he said unto the, to the people there, he said unto them, verse 5, Hear me, ye Levites. Now those were the, the workers in the temple. Sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Now what kind of filthiness could have been in that holy place? We're talking about the temple that Solomon built and the previous kings, including Hezekiah's own father, had allowed filthiness into the temple. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is idolatry. You know, if a, if a man or woman gets involved with idolatry, there's going to be an open door to other things. You don't know all, all of the dirtiness, the filthiness that could have been brought into the temple. There could have been, well, in today's language, we, we might say dirty magazines. We might say lotto tickets. We might say all kinds of things that don't belong. These things don't belong in the temple. They don't belong in the church. They don't belong in our homes, folks. That's why we have to be very careful and protective. I remember once a number of years ago that uh, we had a, a homestay student from uh, China stay in our home for a period of time. And uh, during that time that he was in our home, we got a phone call that uh, he may have brought something into the home. And so we went into his bedroom and we did a search and we found one of these things that they smoke. Um, it's some kind of big device and they put marijuana or something in there and they smoke uh, marijuana with these things. Now, it had not been used. It was still fresh from the store with the wrapper on it. But when the young man came home, we presented this and we said, what in the world is this? And now he didn't use it. It wasn't for him. He said it was for his friend. Whether it was or whether it wasn't, I'll never know. But the fact is, we got that out of the house. That does not belong in the pastor's house. It does not belong in a Christian's home. We have to be careful, and we've got to always be on the lookout that we don't allow evil things in our homes. You allow them in your home, you allow it in your life. And uh, so we have now Hezekiah's cleanup job. Now, what he did was he called for a Passover. And the Passover really hadn't been done in a long time, hadn't been done properly. And he put the word out and he invited everyone to come to Passover. Passover was a very precious, special, and a holy day for the Jews. And of course, it commemorates that day from in Egypt when God brought them out. And on the night before, they took a lamb and they... Uh, put its blood on the doorpost and lintel, and uh, the angel of death came through the land of Egypt, and God's promise is where I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. That's where Passover comes from. And when the angel of death did not see the blood, he entered into that home and killed the firstborn. And we have a tremendous picture of what Christ does for us. When you and I got saved, when we repented of our sins and trusted him to save our souls, the blood of Christ was applied to our lives. And it's like a spiritual Passover. The angel of death ain't going to get us because there's a Passover. You see, Christ died on the cross for our sins. That's why he did it. He could have, he could have just said, oh, 
I'm not going to do this. Drop dead, all of you. And every human would have just dropped dead right then and there. He's God. He has the power to do that. But praise the Lord. He, he didn't come down. Oh, no, he didn't come down. 10,000 angels encamped all around. Hmm? He died for you and for me. Hezekiah was calling the people to a Passover, a very precious ceremony. And the people should have prepared themselves for the Passover, but some of them didn't do it, didn't do it right. <clears throat> it was actually sinful to partake of the Passover when they weren't ceremonially clean. Now, because of this, God allowed some kind of disease or something, some kind of trouble to befall the people. We see that in verse 20. We'll get to that in a moment. Hezekiah saw it also. Um, Hezekiah saw not only the disease, but he saw something else. He saw that the people really did have a good heart. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been there. A lot of people come to church. Why? Because they have a good heart. They have a desire to come. We have almost a parallel situation today. In Hezekiah's day, they didn't properly prepare themselves for the Passover. There are many Christians today that don't realize they're to prepare themselves for Sunday. Sunday is the, the Lord's day. We're to start on Monday and say, Sunday's coming. How do you prepare yourself? You prepare yourself by getting alone with God in your prayer closet every day and reading some scripture and praying. And the next day you do it again. And each day you're walking with him. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And you're saying, man, tomorrow is Sunday. I'm going to get to go into the Lord's house with God's people. Praise the Lord. And many Christians don't realize that they're to be building toward the Lord's day. In many Christian homes, the children are not taught, hey, kids, Sunday's coming. And so when Sunday comes, it's just, uh, just a, uh. And so a lot of Christians make this mistake. They don't prepare themselves properly. And so when they come, to, when they do come to church, they're not getting out of it as much as they ought to. Now, I say that Hezekiah knew that the people had a good heart. That's why they showed up. And so what he did was he prayed for them. And he prayed that the Lord would pardon the people. And look at verse 19 again. Chapter 30, verse 19. It says here, That prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. And so he specifically mentioned their fault. And in verse 20, we see that God heard and answered Hezekiah's prayer and pardoned their sin. Verse 20, the Lord hearkened to Hezekiah and healed the people. So that's how we know that God had sent some kind of problem. You know, God does that sort of thing from time to time to get our attention. Not every cough or cold or headache or backache or something is, you know, meant to get our attention because of some loose living. But, you know, sometimes it is. Sometimes in order to get our attention, God has to make the wheel fall off. So oh, what happened? And it gets us thinking. And then the Holy Spirit says, hmm, maybe we need to spend time with God over this. Sometimes it happens where out of the blue, something goes kablooey and it shouldn't. Out of the blue, a sickness comes, a financial loss, or some eruption in the home, or with a friend, or at work, or something. That just, you know, what is this? It could be. It could be God trying to get our attention when that sort of thing happens. Now, among other things, this passage clearly shows us the willingness of God to forgive His people. I'm going to say that again, because this is really important, folks. The willingness of God to forgive his people. Now, bear in mind something that the people did not continue in their error, thinking that God would just automatically forgive them. That's what he does. Not so. Romans chapter 6, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live, live any longer therein? The woman taken in adultery was forgiven by Jesus, but then he said to her, Go and sin no more. You remember that. In Psalm 66, David wrote, if I regard iniquity in my heart, that means if I make room for it, if I make excuses for it, if I allow it to stay there, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But we can conclude that God is good. 
simply by the evidence that he is willing to forgive his people. I say it again, he is willing to forgive his people. There are some people with a bitter spirit and anyone with a bitter spirit is not willing to forgive the one that offended them. Has that ever happened to you? Or has it, has it ever happened to someone that you, you needed their forgiveness? You went and asked them to forgive you, but they had a bitter spirit and they just couldn't let go of this thing. And they, they turned away from you and says, no, I won't forgive you. People with a bitter spirit cannot forgive. Sometimes people growing up have memories, bad memories of what happened to them as a child. Maybe their brother or sister did things. Maybe their father or mother did things. Their aunt, uncle did things. Or a neighbor did things. And they're, they're upset about that. And uh, maybe they've buried it. It's been repressed. But, you know, as soon as you mention their name, all this feeling of bitterness and anger comes. It's, it's like an acrid, like, a, like a, a taste of acid in the mouth. And uh, where did that come from? That's an unforgiving giving spirit. That's bitterness there. Folks, that's not something that God wants for anyone because bitterness will kill you faster than any enemy on earth. If you're bitter, if you have a bitterness in your heart toward anyone, you need to get rid of that. You say, how can I? They hurt me. You do it by faith. You go to God and you, you first say to God, Lord, listen, I know that I am 10 times the sinner that they are to me. I am to you. I am 10 times the, worse than they are. Lord, you forgave me all my sin. By faith, I put their sin into your hands, Lord. I don't feel like forgiving them. I don't want to forgive them, but by faith, I forgive them. And by faith, you put it into God's hands. And if you start feeling the bitterness again, you do it all over again. And you keep doing it, and it won't be long before you start to, to see the light of day on this thing. You start breathing fresh air once again. Oh, happy day. We can get rid of our bitterness. We really can, if we'll give it over to the Lord. But bitter people can't forgive. But here we learn that God is willing to forgive his people, his sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us our sins. That's right. If we'll go to God and ask God's forgiveness, he is faithful and he is just. He is, it's like in a court of law. He's justified to do it, to forgive us our sins. On what basis is he justified? On the basis of his son, Jesus Christ, who died for those sins. And so God is willing to forgive the sins of his people. We conclude that God is good simply by the evidence that he is willing to forgive his people. You look at a mother and a mother by her very nature is willing to forgive her child. And so God by his very nature is willing to forgive us our sins. If God was never willing to forgive us our sins, then goodness cannot be part of his wonderful nature. But the truth is God is good. That's why I want you to see verse number 18 once again. Look at the end, the last, the last sentence, the last statement here of verse 18. Read it out loud with me. The good Lord pardon everyone. Now let's read it again, please, all together. The good Lord pardoned everyone. Hezekiah used an adjective beside Lord. What was that adjective? Tell me. Good. He is not just the Lord. He is the good Lord. And we know he is good by evidence that he is willing to forgive his people their sins. That is good. And there are many humans that cannot do that. That means they're not good. Well, maybe. But we know that God is good. It's part of his nature. For you and I, goodness, in order for goodness to permeate through our lives, to reach every aspect of our lives, in order for us to be good, we got to practice that. We got to go to God. Actually, they say there's two things that need to happen. If you are a person that wants your life to be marked by goodness, two things need to be ha happen. Number one, you need to be born again. You need to be born again. As long as your father's the devil, you cannot be a good person. Uh, you can be some kind of uh, socially moral person, but in the eyes of God, you cannot be a good person until you become part of his family because you see God is good and he imparts that to his children. And so number one, 
is you need to be saved. You need to be born again. If you've grown up religious, well, that's all good and fine. But you need to be born again. You need to be saved. If you're a good husband or a good wife or a good son or daughter or a good mother or father, all that's good. That's fine. But you still need to be born again. Listen, if you could get to heaven, my friend, by being a a good father. Let's suppose that you're the fathers that are here. Let's suppose you're not just a good father. Let's suppose you're the best father. Let's do this. Let's pretend that you are the best father that ever lived. No other father in all of earth's history has been as good as you. You are the best, the best, the best. You raised your kids with absolute perfection. You never lost your cool. You never had an impure thought. You never said an unkind word. You were the best, the best, the best father ever. Then you died and stood before God. And God says, why should I let you into heaven? And your answer is obvious. You say, well, God, the truth is, I happen to be the best father that ever lived. You're looking at him. Now, if God were to say to you, well, sir, In that case, come right on into heaven. I'd be delighted to have the best father come into heaven. If God did that, then it means that Jesus died for nothing. It means that Jesus died in vain. That's what it means. And you know that's not true. The truth is all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Me, the guy behind the pulpit. Boy, I've done my share of sin. Any one sin would cut off any chance of going to heaven. One sin. That's all it takes. One sin. You say, oh, come on. Just one sin? Everybody sins. I know that's the point, isn't it? Uh, I tell you what. uh, You go to war. How many bullets will it take to kill you? Really, it only would take one bullet in the right place, right? How many times you got to fall off the roof of a... 50-story building in order to die. How many times? Probably just once. Hmm? You get the idea? You're going to have a blood clot. A blood clot is caused by the teensiest, tiniest... uh, Now, let me back up. You're going to have a stroke. Let's put it that way. You're going to have a stroke, and it's caused by a little blood clot. The teensiest, tiniest little thing, you might not even be able to see it with your human eye, and it breaks off somewhere, and it floats through your bloodstream, and gets all the way up to those tiny little capillary tubes up in your brain, and it plugs. And all of a sudden, you go from upright to horizontal. Boom. What happened? What happened? Well, he had a stroke. (gasps) How'd that happen? Did he take a bullet to the brain? No. Did someone hit him with a baseball bat? No. Just the tiniest, tiniest little speck. Back in the days of carburetors, that's old technology, I know. We're all into that fuel-injected stuff today. But back in the days of carburetors, when you had a carburetor, single carburetor sitting on top of your engine, the gas had to flow through this carburetor and be regulated, and it had to go through a tiny little jet with a tiny little hole in it. All it would take is one tiny grain of sand to plug that hole. And your whole car slows down and comes to a stop. You pull off to the side of the road. You're not going anywhere. You can play with your wind wipers all day long. You can turn your radio on if you like. You can even get out and walk around your car, give it a good kick. It's not going anywhere. It only takes one sin. For as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. For a man to say, I'm not a sinner, you're saying God's a liar. What do you mean? Because God has said all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what God says in the Bible. To say, I'm not a sinner, means you're saying God's a liar. Truth is, God's not a liar. We're the liar. God knows what he's talking about. Hey, sin is more than just murder. It's more than just adultery. It's all this other tiny little evil business. That's what it is. Well, God is good by nature and by willing, being willing to forgive our sins. Now, just as God is love, God is good. The, what, the word good, you need to know this. The word good is an action word. It's not something that sits there and does nothing. Goodness means to build up. 
Goodness means to bless, to strengthen, to encourage, but to build up. That's the idea of good. That's what good means. Can I ask you, are you a good person? Do you build up those around you? Do you bless, protect, strengthen? Hmm? Do you build up people? Because that's what God does. Because God is good. As God is love, God is good. Hezekiah knew this and called him the good Lord. The good Lord. And the first evidence is that he's willing to forgive us our sins. Tell me, how much do you know about God? Did you know that God is good? I know that you know that, like theologically, you got that word there. But practically... God is good. You say, well, what do you mean? Well, let's enumerate a few ways in which God is good. We'll just do this really quick. Just take a minute. Here's a few ways that God is good. Number one, God gives us sunshine. Matthew chapter 5, He maketh His sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He comforts His children. John 14, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. God answers our prayers. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me and I will answer thee. God heals our diseases. Psalm 103, verse 3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. God gives us food. Matthew 6. Give us this day our daily bread. God gives us jobs. Philippians 4, but my God shall supply all your need. God gives us babies. Psalm 127, lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. God even feeds the animals. How about that? Psalm 147, he giveth to the beast his food. God even cares for the little animals. How many have ever heard of a kangaroo? Raise your hand. All right. Next question. How many have heard of a rat? Raise your hand. How many have heard of a kangaroo rat? Not many of us. Okay, well, there is such a thing. It's a tiny little creature. It lives in the desert. But did you know that these things need water? God knew. God knew his little kangaroo rat needed water. But what God did was his goodness, he put it into the heart and brain of the little kangaroo rat to dig in the earth, to know where to dig and how to dig down deep where he could find a little plants called tubers. And these tubers are just full of juice. And the little kangaroo rat gets all the water and nourishment that he needs. Why? Because God is good. It has nothing to do with evolution. It's because God is good. He is the good Lord. Goodness is what God is all about. Therefore, Hezekiah called him the good Lord. Did you know that Jesus came and died on the cross for our sins? Why? Because it's the supreme act of goodness. There is nothing ever done in all the earth's history that matches that. You talk about the goodness of God, the greatest evidence, the greatest thing God has ever done as far as goodness is die on the cross for us. But something else When Jesus came to earth, he taught us things about God. And he told us what God was like, and he would often use stories to illustrate. How many have ever heard of the story of the Good Samaritan? Raise your hand. Have you ever heard that, the Good Samaritan? It's a wonderful story, and it teaches that wonderful truth of goodness. But you know something? That story illustrates God, because God is that way. That story, the Good Samaritan, next time you read it, you think about God coming by and finding you, my friend. And not just you, but the guy across the street. Maybe there's someone that you hate. Did you know that God loves that person? Maybe someone who's done you wrong. In the news lately, DNA tests have been finding murderers and rapists and things like that. Modern DNA tests have been linking them together. The crime with the perpetrator. It's been in the news lately. Say, oh boy, those wicked men. I agree. But God still loved them. And God is giving people opportunity to repent. I wonder for how long God will do that. How long will God wait for a man to repent before he says, oh, that's it. Time's up. You're dead. How long will God wait for a woman to get right with God Before he says, that's it, time's up. Oh, the goodness of God, because God is good. The Lord is good. He is the good Lord. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. 
Take your Bible and let's turn to the right to the book of Psalms. We'll do a real quick little look at a couple of Psalms here. And let's look and see if we can't learn a little more about the goodness of God. Go to Psalm 81. Would you do that please? Psalm 81. Psalm 81. Let's do this together. I'll read verse 1, you read verse 2. I'll read verse 3, you read verse 4. Psalm 81, let's begin. Sing aloud unto God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. This he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went out through the land of Egypt, where I heard a language that I understood not. Thou callest in trouble, and I delivered thee. I answered thee in the secret place of thunder. I proved thee at the waters of Meribah, Selah. There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. that my people had hearkened unto me and Israel had walked in my ways. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him, but their time should have endured forever. You see what God wanted to do for his people? Oh, how God wanted to bless his people. He brought them out of Egypt. He loved them. He wanted to do so much for them. But they turned away from God. Isn't that something? They were the losers because they turned away. Turn over two pages to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. We'll do the same thing. I'll read verse 1. You read verse 2. Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Behold, uh, sorry, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and dragon shalt thou trample under feet. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. 